نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين أحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما ألم سل على سيدنا محمد ولا على سل على سيدنا لا محمد البارك سم سل عليه سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, inshallah we'll continue today again going over basically the situation that arose before Karbala which created the situation or created an environment where Karbala was, was able to happen. Uh, and so you end up with the martyrdom of the grandson of the Prophet وسلم, along with many of his family members at the hands of those who claim to be Muslim. So, as we were talking last week, you know, we've mentioned about Mavia, Radion becoming the, the leader uh, after Imam Hassan al-Islam had handed over the rule to him uh, and why that happened and how that happened. Uh, and then the year 50 Hijri, so this took place in the year 41 uh, or the beginning of 41 year Hijri. And so year 50 Hijri, Imam Hassan al-Islam is martyred. By, by poison and so there's this question now as to who will become the leader after Mahabia. You know, because before the martyrdom of Imam Hassan everybody assumed that he would be the leader after Mahabia. and so at the age of uh, 47 he's martyred and so now this question arises and so you have various people throwing out various things. And this is when Mavia you know, becomes inclined toward one of his sons whose name is Yazid. Again, this was a son who was, whose mother is Christian, who was raised amongst the Christians. Uh, however, he's physically and from a worldly standpoint very talented. Uh, and so a lot of the advisors of Mavia are pointing him in this direction. Uh, even though initially he really, if you look at the literature, he, he in some ways despised this son of his. But now he also becomes inclined toward this son uh, and names him heir apparent to become the leader after himself. If you remember the five conditions that Imam Hassan al-Islam placed upon Mavia in order to hand over the rule, the last condition was that he was not to name anybody as his successor. And I'm going to get this to this later on as well, is that, again, the companions of the Prophet are not masum, they are not innocent, but they are mahfuz, they are protected. So they did make mistakes, you know, they even sinned, and yet the door of repentance was open for them and they always went through that door in the end. So that's an important point to understand. You know, because again, you've had companions, we had companions of the Prophet ﷺ who had committed even zina, you know, adultery or drank, uh, alcohol and all these other things. But we don't look at that because we look at their repentance in the end, which is what, it, what mattered. The end just, the end is in reality all that matters. You know, like Rasulullah said that, you know, there's a man who all his life is doing everything right and then in the end, he does something that leads him into disbelief and he, and he will end up in the fire. And you have another person who all his life has done something, has done the wrong things and yet in the end he repents for all of these, those things sincerely and he ends up in paradise. 
the thing though is how we live is generally how we die you know if we live righteously then inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us a good death and if we live you know unrighteously then we will end up more than likely you know, with a bad death so when Mabia Radion he names Yazid as his heir you know to become the real ruler after himself then he starts going around the various parts of the empire taking bayah or taking allegiance from everybody that after me you will be loyal to Yazid. Yazid also put on a good front, you know, this facade of, of superficial right, righteousness. Even though he would slip up here and there and things would become a, somewhat apparent to those who are looking at things with different eyes. And then you had those who truly knew his nature and knew the situation. And so when he comes to Medina Munawwara, you know, when Mahavya Radeon comes to Medina Munawwara with his son Yazid, and he gives a sermon and in the sermon he asks everybody to give allegiance to Yazid after him. And there are five, five people in Medina Munawwara who stood up and objected immediately. And those five were of the Rahman bin Abu Bakr, the oldest son of Abu Bakr. Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, radiallahu anhum, and Imam Hussein alayhi So these said, no, we are not going to give allegiance to this man. And also call, basically call him out on how he could name such a person as his heir. Or name anyone as a successor. The most vocal at this time of these was Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. So you have, you know, the son of Abu Bakr, the the brother of, the wife of Rasulullah the beloved wife of Rasulullah Bibi Aisha Sadiqa, radiallahu anha. And so, because he's so vocal and so firm in in this rejection. You know, you have propaganda now churning among those who are in some position within the empire. And the namely, the governor of Medina Munawwara, Marwan bin Hakam. Again, the name that I, you know, I, when I mentioned earlier, I said, remember this name because it'll come up again. Again, Marwan was the cousin of Uthman, the son of, of Hakam, who, when Uthman Radion became Muslim, wrapped Uthman in a carpet and lit it up. And it was Abu Bakr Radun who seeing this came and saved him from the situation. Okay. So Hakam along with this son were exiled by Rasulullah And then after Hakam, uh, Hakam died, Marwan was called back by Uthman when Uthman Radun was Khalifa. So during the reign of, of, or during most of the reign of Mavia, Marwan is the governor of Medina. Those who know, know his, you know, or those who are there who know him, you know, they know that he's a hypocrite. And so when, when Abdur, Abdur Rahman bin Abu Bakr, you know, if, and if you look at these five, these five are not only the sons of Sahabi, these five are all also Sahabi. So they are not only the sons of the companions of Rasulullah, they themselves are the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All five of them openly reject this. And because of their rejection, all of the people of Hijaz say, we won't accept him unless they accept him. So what Marwan does in Medina Munawwara is he starts turning the propaganda machine against Abdul Rahman. You know, he knows that this time he can't do anything Imam, against Imam Hussein al-Islam openly, but against Abdul Rahman, he starts saying that oh, you know, he's that uh, this is you know he's saying this because he has dreams of becoming the ruler after Mawi. 
It was, there were some people who said that, well, after Mavia, then Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr Radun should become the leader. So, oh, this is why he's objecting, you know, because of his, his <coughs> ambitions to be the ruler. And he also quoted a verse of the Quran, which I'm blanking on right now, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about someone being the uh, son of a wretched person. He says, oh, this is referring to him. And so when they start this propaganda, Abdul Rahman goes to his sister, the wife of Rasulullah, so some Bibi Aisha Siddiqah, and he says, this is what they are saying, and she says, no, this verse actually refers to Marwan himself. He is the son of a wretched and the son of a wretched. He is wretched and he is the son of a wretched. So this is the ruling of Aisha Siddiqah herself. Eventually, you know, time goes on. These five remain firm in their opposition. The other thing that happens within the empire is that there is a man named Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is a ruthless you know, oppressor. Uh, he, his mother said that he was the son of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is the father of Mabia. Abu Sufyan became uh, Sahabi after the conquest of Makkah. If you remember, he's also the one who brought the army against Rasulullah in Uhud, also in Khandaq, uh, and various other battles. So his mother claimed that Abu Sufyan was his father. Abu Sufyan denied it. And Abu Sufyan, and, and even though the claim was before Islam. So from an Islamic perspective, if he did something before becoming Muslim, once he became Muslim, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And so there was no real reason from an Islamic perspective for him to deny it, but he denied even knowing the woman. She insisted on this and he denied it. Until he passed, he, he denied it until he, you know, to the day that he died. But after his death, his son, Mavia, took Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in and brought him into the fold and made him a governor of Busra. Because wherever he was, wherever he went, you know, any opposition was crushed. So this is how he gained prominence. So he becomes the governor of Busra, uh, as well as leader in various other areas, you know, because he keeps a tight, you know, tight handle on everything. In Medina, again, the propaganda machine is turning against these five, indirectly against Imam Hussein al-Islam, directly against the rest of them. Uh, eventually, Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr passes away before, you know, 60 Hijri. Abu Huraira Radion was, of course, he's one of the fam famous companions of Rasulullah sallallahu who is also known as Sultan al Hadith you know, because so many narrations of a Hadith are through him. Even though he accepted Islam in the seventh year of Hijri, you know, basically he spent four years with the Rasulullah but most of the narrations of Rasulullah are through him because Rasulullah made special dua for him. Uh, and if you, the story behind that is, and I'll go over that very quickly, is that, you know, he, he, he came and he would sit in front of the house of Rasulullah Sassam just waiting for Rasulullah Sassam to come out and say something. And in the beginning, he couldn't remember anything. So he came to Rasulullah Sassam and said, Yeah, Rasulullah Sassam, you say things and I forget. You do things and I can't remember. So Rasulullah Sassam laid a cloth on, on the ground and made some markings in it with his finger. And then took that cloth and laid it on the chest of Abu Huraira and made dua for him, made supplication for him. And Abu Huraira says, after that I never forgot anything. 
Because Rasulullah by doing this action actually transferred the knowledge to him. So when he heard the hadith, the hadith was already there in his heart. But he used to make dua, there's a hadith in Bukhari where he says, Abu Hurairah, he says that there are two kinds of knowledge that Rasulullah gave me. One of which is what I tell you that Rasulullah said such. And the other, if I tell you, you will cut my head off. And he's saying this to the leaders of Banu Umayyah. Because those were the hadith that criticized what was coming from Banu Umayyah. Where Rasulullah said that I see uh, young, youngsters playing on my pulpit. Again, referring to the young kings of Banu Umayyah. And Abu Huraira would make a dua that, Oh Allah, do not allow me to see the kingdom of the boy. And he would also say, Ya Allah, do not allow me to see the 60th year of Hijri. Because Yazid becomes the king at the end of the 60th year of Hijri. On the 59th year of Hijri is when Abu Huraira Radun passes away. And on his deathbed, you know, he's on his deathbed, he's so weak he can't even sit up, much less stand. You know, he's about to go and Marwan shows up. You know, Marwan bin Hakam, he shows up. And he comes to Abu Huraira Radu and he says to him, he says that we have loved everything about you. You know, we have, we have loved and liked everything about you except for your love for Abu Hassan and Hussein. You know, the grandsons of Rasulullah. I mean, you have to imagine this. You know, here's a man who, who's so weak, you know, he's last moments of his life on this earth. You know, he can't even sit up. But the words of Marwan struck, uh, struck him so hard harshly that he stood up I mean he sat up he sat up in that condition and he says to Marwan he says that we were on an expedition with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his daughter accompanied, accompanied us in that expedition and on our way back we ran out of water and there is, there is crying coming from the Hawdaj of Bibi Fatima. You know, the daughter of Rasulullah Sun, the women, they would travel in the Hawdaj, which was the box that they would place on top of the camel. You know, and it would be enclosed. So they could, they would, they could travel in privacy. And there is crying coming from this Hawdaj. And Rasulullah Sun stops the army. And he goes to the camel of Bibi Fatima, salamu alayhi, and he asks her, he says, what, why are my sons crying? You know, he referred to his grandsons as his sons. He says, why are my sons crying? And she said, yeah, Rasulullah, they are thirsty and there is no water. And so Rasulullah, he turns to the army, he says, does anybody have any water? And he says, Abu Hurairah Radun says, every one of us. You know, we started looking for water, seeing if we had any, any, a drop of water, because everyone wanted to be the one to give some water to Rasulullah, Sallallahu yeah. Alaihi Wasallam. And there was none, nobody had anything. And when they, when we tell Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no one has any water, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to, to his daughter, he says, give me my son. And he says that we saw the blessed hand of Bibi Fatima come out of the Hawdaj with Imam Hassan al-Islam in her, in her arms and she gives him to her and Rasulullah takes him from her. And he places his tongue within the mouth of Imam Hassan until, and he suckles on that tongue until he is satisfied. And he hands him back and he says, give me my other son. And so she gives him Imam Hussain al-Islam and he, he does the same with him until he is satisfied and he hands him back and then the army continues and he says how can I not love those like this how can I not love the ones that Rasulullah loves like this you know it's interesting like I mentioned about uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad 
And if you also look at the history of Marwan bin Hakam, even his birth is questionable. You know, Rasulullah says that, you know, three kinds of people have animosity towards Ali. Either those who are conceived in, in, in uh, uncleanliness, those who are illegitimate, or those who are hypocrites. And so if you say, look at Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, two of those categories fall on him. You know, Marwan, at least one, probably two. We'll continue from here next week. I'm actually going to end a little early today. Uh, we have a brother here, uh, Alhamdulillah, who's here, who wants to take the Shahada. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we'll do that before the Salat, inshallah. Uh, and then, but, uh, you know, just a few minutes just talking about this quickly. Uh, you know, Islam, Rasulullah said, Islam is fitra. It is the natural way. You know, if you take somebody and you don't have outside forces influencing him, then Islam is his way. This is the way that you naturally are inclined towards. You know, it's the environment that pushes us away. And he says that it is the parents who make the child, you know, Christian or, or Jew or Muslim or whatever else yeah. or that environment that they are given but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also gives us he has given us the authority or the power to analyze and to choose and so irregardless of what type of household we are born into or what environment we live in even though the environment affects us, we still have that ability to analyze what's going on in society, to look at what's going on around us, and to find the truth within all of the lies. And so, and this is the responsibility that he has given us or rather one of the responsibilities that he has given us. Because our natural inclination is toward Islam. It's toward the way that Rasulullah SAW has brought for us. You know, this is, this is the natural inclination that Allah SWT has put within mankind. It's the, so again, it's, it, when we force ourselves away from that natural inclination, then we have taken, us, taken ourselves away from Islam. And if you think about this, you know, like, you know, even like a thief, you know, the first time he steals, if you ask him what happened when the first time you did this, or a murderer or anybody else who commits any, you know, of these heinous crimes and then keeps doing it later on. If you ask him, what, what, how did you feel the first time you did it? They all tell you about the fear and the guilt and all of that that they had at that first moment. But then when they kept doing it, they silenced that voice that was inside them, telling them, look, this isn't right. So either we silence it ourselves, or society tries to silence it for us. But the voice is still there, irregardless of how deep we, we uh, buried it, it's still there. And that inclination toward Islam remains. But again, if we choose to ignore it, that's our own problem. So even being born Muslim, for those who are, of us who are born Muslim, it is still our responsibility, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an multiple times, that don't you ponder, don't you think, don't you analyze. Because our belief is not simply because our parents told us, but our belief is the certainty of Allah and the certainty of Rasulullah Sallallahu being the messenger of Allah. Because of all the proofs 
that are all in front of us all the time. But when someone comes back, you know, after they've been on a different path and they come back to Islam, you know, Allah Taala says, uh, Rasulullah told us that, you know, it's everything before that gets wiped clean. You know, so if, if a non-Muslim becomes Muslim, then everything that he did before is wiped away. But there is a difference. If an atheist becomes Muslim, then everything before is wiped away and is kept empty. And now he starts new after he accepts Islam. But if someone comes into Islam from either Christianity or Judaism, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a favor to them, you know, because they at least were, were trying to follow a book before. But also as a favor to them, all of the deeds before that, whether good or bad, from a worldly standpoint, are written down as good deeds. So now it's not even, okay, you can say, okay, he's a newborn baby. No. It's even better than that. Because you're starting off with a full sheet of good. You know, now the job is to add on to it. You know, so, uh, you know, our brother Kelvin is here. Uh, and he's going to take the shahada, inshallah. Uh, so... Uh, so those who have not made sunnah, go ahead and make sunnah, then after sunnah, then we'll give him the shahada, inshallah. Let some other people come as well to be witnesses to this, inshallah.